which types of messages work, nor, in general, recent evidence much about whether these things work at all. And in terms of these backfire effects, like I said, there's a problem in that when you seem to give people the impression that things are common, that they happen a lot, even if the overall message is, it's bad, don't do it, it still can make people apparently do this more. And there's some like, survey experiments that have been done by political scientists recently in Costa Rica They weren't in the context of um, trying to fight corruption. They were very explicitly just seeing, is there this type of self-reinforcing phenomenon? And they gave people information about corruption increasing in Costa Rica and then asked them, would you be willing to give a bribe? And the people who had been shown these flyers about corruption increasing compared to people who had not, dramatically increased how willing they themselves are to give a bribe. Whether it's because they think, oh, it's not so bad, or maybe I'm not getting something other people are getting, there's a number of things here that could be happening. But then it also opens the up possibility that what if you kind of harness that social norms idea and said, well, look, things are maybe a little better than you thought. Could you flip that around and decrease corruption? And so these are the two ideas that I was playing with. Just to give you a sense of how, even though I'm using experiments here, this is very much what's happening immediately these days in Ukraine. In Ukraine. So on the left here, we've got pictures from uh, the airport in Kiev when you land, saying things like stop corruption. Uh, on the right, we have uh, a poster from an anti-corruption uh, seminar run at Kiev Mogila University. And as you see here, these, in, these, these numbers here are showing different ratings of corruption over time in Ukraine. So even though this is a, an, about fighting corruption, there is a message here that's being given to the students of corruption in Ukraine keeps increasing. And that's exactly the types of experiments that I tried to replicate in here. So the idea, because it's quite difficult to figure out what is the impact of people going throughout their day, getting this information in different forms, the idea behind here is to isolate some of these effects and in a survey show some people no information, some people information about fighting corruption but emphasizing a positive message like I have here on one side saying corruption is actually going down and another a negative message saying fight corruption we have to because it's going up and it's causing all these problems. So both of these here are of the idea that corruption is a bad thing, we want to fight it, but they're giving different underlying information. For what it's worth, these are both accurate, these are, these are accurate data in both cases. They're just from different sources and, and slightly different years um, to emphasize a different message. And then the thing that I was looking was a question of would you be willing to pay a bribe in order to receive a driver's license more quickly or easily? And I recognize that this is a sensitive question. I'd be happy to talk more about the degree of people who might be honest, dishonestly answering this question. Some other things that were done as well to approach this question in terms of more sensitive survey questions. And I get fairly similar results using those. I'm going to hold off on that for now. I mean, if people are interested, I'd be happy to talk more about it. But in terms of the results, what I find is that in the full sample, about 16.5% of people said yes. Openly, no problem. I would give a bribe to get my license quicker and more easily. You get somewhat of a decline about two percentage points, which is, you know, it seems modest, about 13% reduction, uh, when you show them that corruption is actually decreasing, and that's why they should be fighting it. You get less of a decline when you show the negative treatment, saying corruption is increasing, but that's why we have to fight it more. But if we look at other parts of the sample, like we might expect, for example, younger people to be more susceptible to this type of information than older people, we see more dramatic effects. So when we look, for example, by age, and look at the younger people, we see something more like a three and a half percentage point drop that's much more noticeable. Part of that, though, is that the older people, whether this is that they're lying more or that they actually do engage in corruption less, or that they just didn't think getting a driver's license was pertinent because they already have a driver's <laughs> license for many, many years, answer this question quite differently. So there's a low level to begin with, but there's also almost no movement in terms of how the information is affecting them. There's quite a bit of movement among the younger people. The one area where there is some evidence of a backfire effect is when you look at people's prior expectations. And so before seeing the flyers, there was some information asking, what is your expectation about the extent to which there's bribery in Ukraine? And unfortunately, there's not a lot of people in Ukraine who believe it's low. <laughs> but among those who do believe it's low, that is those who believe that less than 40% of people give bribes in Ukraine, you do see a dramatic um, backfire effect among the, the negative treatment. That is, when you tell people who think that corruption is sort of low, that is actually going up, you see an increase of about five percentage points in terms of willingness to give uh, bribes. On the other hand, when you take the people who really think that it's even more extensive than it is in Ukraine, who believe that 70% or more Ukrainians are giving bribes, you show them it's going down in this effort to fight corruption, you get a more dramatic effect than anything else we've seen, about a 7% drop here between the black and the striped line 
in the middle. Before I wrap up, I want to talk briefly about one additional um, experiment that, was, that, I, that I took this a little bit further. So survey experiments are nice in that it was covering the entire country. Um, but it's just to be hypothetically saying, would you give a bribe or not? And of course, for a number of reasons, it's quite difficult to go out and actually get people to give real bribes and see how it can affect them and so on. And so one way that's increasingly been used to look at this is by putting students in laboratory games where they play for real money. I'd be happy to again talk more about the extent to which these games reflect reality. I didn't used to believe they do, and now I'm a believer. And so I'd be happy to talk about why I think that these are not entirely artificial, even though it may seem somewhat strange to put students in the lab and say, pretend you're a bureaucrat, become your citizen, and see how they react. So again, something I'd be happy to talk more about. But the key here is that people are gaining or losing real money based on the decisions that they make. And in this role-playing game, uh, this was done with Ukrainian uh, university students at a, at a legal academy. Uh, in this role-playing game, basically, the person assigned to play the role of a citizen was trying to get a permit. And in order to get the permit and get more money in real life by getting that permit, they had to pay a bribe. And if the bureaucrat accepted that, the bureaucrat and the citizen could get more money. I focused, because I didn't have the same number, I only had um, about uh, 700 students participating in this instead of thousands like I had in the national sample. So I focused just on one of the messages, the ones that seemed stronger, the positive message, because also I wanted to see if you could do something with this positive social norms idea that you could reduce corruption by saying corruption is going down. And again, this brings the focus back to the people we might expect this to matter most for, young people. And indeed, showing before they play this game, so half the group was showing this flyer and half was not. And before they play this game, about 10 minutes after they do some other, they see the flyer, then they do some other things, and then they play this game. It has a dramatic effect, both overall, in terms of the percent of students in either position, the citizen or the bureaucrat, in participating in a bribe transaction, dropping from 32.2%, who did it to 24.8%. And the biggest effect happens to be with the citizens. That is, the ones who are playing the role of bureaucrat, this had less of an effect on them. But on the ones who are specifically in the role of citizen after being told that your fellow citizens are engaging in corruption less than perhaps you thought they were, or that at least it's headed in a good direction, and being prompted to think, we need to fight corruption together, had a dramatic effect here of almost 12 percentage points, a really significant change. So I'll wrap up with that. I'd be happy to give more details about either of those experiments and ways to interpret them. Um, but the preliminary evidence here is that there is something to this idea of using positive messaging. That if we're going to use information, the idea of using something saying things are getting better, join in this, rather than look at how bad things are or things are getting worse, we have to fight it, could have pretty significant effects. These effects are strongest among younger people, not surprisingly. And there's limited evidence of the backfire issue here, but it is present potentially in something that sh people should be paying attention to. There's, of course, a number of things that still need to be looked at. This is artificial in the sense that this is just something that's to be seen once. In Ukraine, you're constantly seeing these things on every bus stop. So what's the impact of this over time? What's the difference in terms of seeing a flyer versus videos versus TV and so on? And finally, uh, what's the difference between the message in terms of the actual words and content and the visuals and things like that? So there's lots more to do. Um, this is just one first step in this project, but I do think that there's something to all this information that's being used Unfortunately, my impression, particularly when I, I did interviews with a lot of the, the different organizations, both foreign and domestic in Ukraine, who are putting out these flyers, is being done in an incredibly haphazard way. Um, with no coordination among the, the 10 different groups putting these out, no assessment about what works, not even a whole lot of forethought about whether or not it's a good idea what they're doing, more just what would get people's attention to look at this. Which is good when you need to raise people's thinking about corruption, but as I think many people in this room know, most people in Ukraine are already quite aware of this corruption, uh, and more something a little more sophisticated needs to happen in order for it to be fought. Thanks very much, and I look forward to questions later on. Thanks, Jordan. Sorry for the mix-up with the no title. Um, I'm pretty sure I have the right title for the next presentation. Uh, we have uh, Oleksiy Hanan from uh, Kiev Mohila Academy. Uh, presenting a paper on um, the uh, Ukraine's big election year. Winners take a toll. Okay. Slides will be at the end. Okay. Ah, okay. Let's do that. 
Okay, to follow on on corruption topic, I would say that I'm representing non-corrupt institution, which is Kiev Mohil Academy, and we do not have we do not have corruption since the founding, refounding of Kiev Mohila, which happened in 1992, and at that time nobody believed it was possible to have corruption-free university, but we did it. And we are very happy that now the system of external independent evaluation is is active throughout the country, which actually makes the entrance to universities corruption free. Okay, but now I'm to talk. So it means that something is possible to do, even if you have perception of total corruption. Oh, by the way, one more example of non-corruption: biometric passport. You know, in Soviet system to get foreign passport, all these queues and. It was incredibly, incredibly difficult and involving some small bribes and all this stuff with biometric passports. It's very, very easy, pleasant, people are smiling to you. <laughs> so now, ten, now Ukrainians uh, received, ten, 10 million Ukrainians received uh, biometric passport uh, without bribes. Okay. Uh, now, let's go to the topic of Ukrainian elections. The good thing about Ukraine, as you know, as we do not know results of any elections. So elections do matter and electoral choice uh, do matter. At this point, there's no clear leader and all the leaders are very, very close. One of the problem is that unfortunately there's no clear candidate whom we can call a liberal reformer. We have a group of bright, democratically oriented people, but they are competing with each other. They appear to be unable to form a unified force. So I would say that among people who have the chances to be uh, elected in co according, to, according to the polls are Timoshenko, Poroshenko, I would add former Minister of Defense Gritsenko, who present Timoshenko and Poroshenko, they considered to be old faces, okay? Gritsenko presents himself as new face, in fact, he's old face, mm -hmm. but it's, 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 it's not a problem, I believe, because I consider him to be a personal and honest guy who is really in favor of reforms, but one of his, we don't know about much about his potential team, and actually he appointed his chief of staff, Mr. Baloga, who is a man of the past. So, if we expect that any of these candidates would win the elections, and again, we don't know exactly who it would be in the second round. Perhaps Mr. Mashenka, but who will be competitor, we don't know. Uh, if anybody of these uh, would win elections, I would predict there would be a slow zigzag economic reforms and approximation to Europe because we have this association agreement. So there would be a gradual moving forward with zigzags and uh, uh, definitely uh, it doesn't mean there would be radical, radical reforms. Uh, with Timoshenko we have a problem. The problem is that actually if she is elected, she is very strong person and she there is a danger that she can mono, try to monopolize power. Okay, uh, Poroshenko also tried to to uh, do it, but actually not very efficiently. And one of the good things for Ukraine is that we have a constitutional balance system. Okay, so the government is formed according to the results of parliamentary elections. Prime Minister is appointed by the ruling coalition and president doesn't have uh, possibility to dismiss him. So basically they are to coexist, and the government is to rely on the uh, coalition in the parliament. Uh, which means that whoever is elected, his power, elected president, his power would be counterbalanced by parliament. And we have elections in uh, March, April, presidential elections next year, and in October we'll have parliamentary elections. So actually a lot would depend on who will be on the results of parliamentary elections. And here comes the question of potential Russian interference. Uh, theoretically, there could be a pro-Russian candidate in the second round if we have two pro-Russian, well, let's say pro-Russian candidates, schematically described pro-Russian candidates, and if they join their efforts, which is not clear, 
So theoretically, there could be one pro-Russian candidate in the second round, but he doesn't have a chances to win. So what Russia may, uh, may design? Actually, to use parliamentary elections and to, again, pro-Russian forces would not get the majority, it's clear, uh, according to all the polls, but they, would, they could influence somehow creating of coalition manipulation behind the scene in the parliament, trying to destabilize the situation and to have a prime minister who would be, say, more comfortable to Russia than the present one. In order to interfere in the elections, uh, Russia has actually a lot of, still have a lot of uh, potential because, for example, from informational point of view, three large informational channels are reflects, to a great extent, pro-Russian position. Uh, one inter is owned by former chief of staff of President Yanukovych, Mr. Lovachkin. Talented guy, but I would say he's fighting on the side of evil. Uh, then uh, the second one, uh, which is news one, is controlled by his deputy chief of staff in the administration of President Yanukovych, the guy is now in Moscow, he escaped from Ukraine, but somehow he managed to control this channel. And finally, the third channel, 112, 120, is controlled by Mr. Medvedchuk, and Putin is his godfather of uh, his daughter. Okay, so they're very, very closely connected to, uh, to Russia. And definitely Russia, what Russia is trying to use is uh, trying to use the rules of democratic game in order to undermine Ukraine democracy. Okay? And this is a paradox, because the country is at war, and Poroshenko didn't introduce emergency situation in 2014-2015. He's proud of it. He's saying openly that I'm proud that even in time of war, uh, we didn't introduce, so there is freedom. Actually, I think that it was a mistake, and after elections of the parliament in 2014, and after Debaltsev, actually, what happened at the front line, he had all the possibilities to introduce this emergency situation. Um, in time, in time of war, at least in the Donbass, at least in two years. But he didn't do that. Um, and I would say that at this point, the level, given the wartime situation, the level of Ukrainian democracy, including mass media freedom, uh, is unprecedented. So this is a paradox. And this is used by Putin. So this is one of the paradoxes of Ukrainian situation and Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations. OK, now I have how many? Three minutes. So let me. The issue of the war. The issue of the war in the Donbass, how it will play uh, in the parliamentary elections. So it's important to understand that most Ukrainian, most Ukrainians, more than 50 percent, uh, are in favor of compromises, but not all. So basically, I would say the radicals who are in favor of military solution and those who, would, who are ready to agree to everything which Putin is proposing are in minority on the flanks. Majority of Ukrainians are in favor of compromises, but not all. And then we're asking the question, so what compromises for you are acceptable and what are not acceptable? Not acceptable, actually everything which is demanded by Putin or which is written in the political part of Minsk agreements. Ukrainians doesn't buy it. So what does it mean? It means that, for example, if uh, our Western partners are pressing on Ukraine to implement first political part of Minsk agreements and then the security part, it would mean destabilization of the government. According to the logic of Minsk agreement, security first, and then political part, which is not very favorable for Ukraine. 
uh, but given the present situation, actually any pressure on Ukraine and even desire of Poroshenko or other government or would be president to uh, adopt one of these would mean destabilization of, uh, of Ukrainian, would mean destabilization on Ukraine. Big question, to what compromises Ukrainians are ready? And because I don't have time and I have presentation, we agreed, because I have results of recent polls, we agreed that I would be given a slot in the next panel on the Donbass. Thank you for this. And I will show it to you to what compromises Ukrainians are ready. So we'll keep in <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned. After this commercial break. <laughs> Uh, third, we have uh, Volodymyr uh, Dubovik from uh, Mechnikov National University in Odessa, dissecting Trump's administration's policy on Ukraine. Right, an easy subject. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. Oh, it is not. Right. Well, an easy subject indeed, and uh, 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 I've been talking about us ukraine relations, including in the format of Ponder's uh, annual conferences for a number of years now. And that's a fascinating uh, topic as ever uh, this time. We are now well into the second year of uh, Donald Trump's presidency, and there's a lot to talk about. Uh, Ukraine-US relations were off to the uh, uh, low start initially when Trump came to the White House for the primary reason of uh, Ukrainians betting on the wrong horse in 2016. And of course, that's never been f forgotten, I believe, and never will be forgotten by the people who are occupying the White House now. Uh, Ukrainians, of course, were very troubled by the statements uh, made by Trump on the campaign trail, and that, of course, made them uh, very much favoring uh, his opponent, and uh, that's uh, harmed him a lot. And we can also remember that uh, the materials and some information uh, that was provided by uh, people in Ukraine toppled or made the, the, to, to leave the, the campaign chair for Manafort. And Manafort being on trial, this Ukraine connection is always there in the press. And I'm not sure necessarily that's making us uh, look good <laughs> every time we read an article about Manafort doing this, this or that. I mean, surprisingly, you know, the last piece of information was that he was very much involved in pushing uh, the signing of the cessation agreement on the European integration of Ukraine. So there are pluses and minuses, I suppose. As we remember, the Yanukovych administration was quite active in preparing for the signing in, in Vilnius for at least two years prior to abruptly cancelling the signing uh, 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 then in 20. Uh, 2014. Um, well, uh, surprisingly, though, there is a, a, a huge amount of continuity in U.S. policy towards Ukraine. Um, surprisingly, if you look at the Donald Trump's impulses and his statements and his constant praising of uh, Mr. Putin and him questioning uh, whether Crimea should be recognized as a part of Russian Federation, perhaps. At least he did so on campaign trail. I don't think he did anything like this since he became president. Uh, uh, so that's why I use this uh, term, surprisingly. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not uh, anything new, uh, and it's not just on Ukraine. Uh, the mention of this country's foreign policy, that there are many foreign policies of this country. And it's hard to dissect them indeed, and many people are confused in Ukraine as well. Every time the U.S. does something to support Ukraine, people begin to say, well, that's Donald Trump. See, he's, uh, he's actually great for Ukraine. And then others begin to say, well, it's probably not him. As sometimes it's actually despite <laughs> what President says or does that his administration still does some positive things on Ukraine. So that's complicated. It's very confusing even for scholars, let alone some uh, you know, average Ukrainians who are trying to come up with uh, ideas to uh, uh, is it good or bad thing that Trump is a president for Ukraine. Uh, the sanctions are still there, and of course they are. It's the only instrument, only real viable instrument that any country in the West, including US, have uh, basically to, to uh, 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 impact on Russia's behavior. Uh, are they biting? I think they are. I remember the previous president has been saying it's a number of occasions that the sanctions are working, and I think they are, but it's hard to estimate how well they are working. Obviously, they haven't uh, led to the Russians uh, altering their behavior in a dramatic way. Obviously not. Uh, but there are many other uh, uh, indicators. Uh, and who knows uh, if there is no sanctions, what Russian behavior would be. It could have been much more aggressive line towards Ukraine. Even it could be a deeper incursions. It could be more of aggression and so on. So. I mean, uh, sanctions, I think they are working. And also what matters is not just uh, sanctions laws, 
being signed, uh, but also how they implement it. Uh, because as we all well know, there are many laws and sanctions in the recent years, and there are some in the works right now on the Hill. Uh, but the, what matters is how they implement it. Unfortunately, many of the previous sanctions have uh, left a lot of loopholes and ways around the sanctions, and those were used uh, by Russians to, to actually avoid the punishment for their wrongdoings towards Ukraine. Of course, the financial, project, uh, financial uh, support provided to Ukraine, there are many projects funded by US in Ukraine, and actually we had a meeting yesterday at the Foreign Service Institute with a bunch of, yeah, with a bunch of uh, incoming diplomats uh, coming to Ukraine, training uh, to go to the US Embassy in, in Kyiv, and I begged them to do a better job in terms of disseminating knowledge about what the US is doing, what sort of projects they're supporting in Ukraine, because a lot of people in Ukraine are just not aware of that, and that's, and that's bad, because actually it's a very impressive long list of projects that the US is helping us to deal with. Uh, the reforms are there as well on the agenda, of course. Uh, uh, basically, the Ukrainian civil society, NGOs, activists on one si uh, side, and then the West, the US government in this case, and the other side are becoming the major allies in terms of pushing our government to and making them and pushing them to do the right thing. Uh, that's unfortunate, of course, that uh, our government requires such a little push in, in the right direction, but that's uh, how it is, and we appreciate American help there. The issue of corruption is something that we talk about a lot about in Ukraine. Uh, that's uh, already progress because for a number of years corruption was there, but we didn't really talk much about it publicly. Now it's almost like an obsession uh, uh, with the issue of corruption. Everybody talks about it. So that's already a step forward. I mean, first you need to talk about the issue and then you probably find some recipes and some solutions. Uh, American uh, position here was very important in defending the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, uh, defending the idea of creation of an uh, anti-corruption court. So there are many, many ways that Americans are uh, helpful there. To the extent that some people are complaining in Ukraine, like uh, why are they even interfering with our affairs, uh, uh, there is this idea of uh, you know, the external management that people bring up quite often. Uh, and uh, I actually, a couple years ago here at the Bonners, uh, uh, I presented a memo which was entitled, Is Ukraine Becoming Client State of the US? So, I don't think so. <laughs> that's, what I, that's the conclusion I've reached, reached in that memo. Uh, but th there is a role for, for US to play. And also, uh, uh, the, the Donbass and Crimea, two issues are important, of course, and the American position here is important. Uh, I've, I've listened to uh, Ambassador Kurt Walker speaking about this at the Yalta European Strategy just a few days ago in Kyiv. Uh, basically, uh, he says that Minsk remains uh, relevant. Uh, however, uh, not so much in terms of a way to resolve the conflict, meaning that Ukraine, in his opinion, fulfilled much of its obligations. Maybe not all of those, but much of the obligations in the face of other side really not doing anything. And then, and then in terms of fulfilling those obligations. And then who is that other side? The problem with Minsk, of course, is that uh, they make Kiev talk to DNR and LNR, but they're nobodies. I mean, that's, <laughs> this really should be Russia there, who you talk to about the future of Donbass resolution of settlement, right? So uh, US is sort of back here with Walker, uh, walker Surkov uh, format, but that's not really coming forward uh, any successfully. Yeah, or is not much progress being made, for instance, uh, Kurt Walker has been pushing this idea of uh, peacekeeping force being placed in Donbass, but the Russians are stalling. Their, way, their position on this is it's either our uh, uh, you know, model of how should we implement it, uh, put in place, or nothing is happening. So, and that's exactly what's going on. Nothing is happening because, of course, the Russian model of peacekeeping force there is just a, a way to make it a frozen conflict, which might have been even a progress because right now it's not frozen and right now we, people are dying on a daily, you know, as we speak on a daily basis so maybe making Donbass a frozen conflict would be a step forward in a way, you know, paradoxically, ironically, if I might say. Uh, but um, it is how it is. On Crimea, of course, it's a difficult situation. Uh, it's incorporated uh, de, de facto into Russian Federation. Uh, we appreciated the Crimean Declaration which was pushed forward on July 25th. However, Crimean Declaration on the little uh, mentioning of uh, of the, the the Stimson Declaration from 1940 uh, was in it wasn't Stimson anyway from 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 the 
Baltic's declaration uh, from 1940, that's interesting because that tells you that American government doesn't see any, any quick and easy solution to Crimea, and basically it's uh, declaring that they're prepared to play a long game on Crimea uh, in terms of trying to push it in the direction that Crimea would be returned to Ukraine's uh, fault, but that's not easy to do. Uh, most finally, uh, uh, the normalizing Putin uh, is something that we don't uh, s uh, like to see in Ukraine of, a, of uh, something uh, similar to what happened in Helsinki primarily, which was really, I think, an embarrassment uh, for, for the foreign policies, uh, foreign policy of this country. Uh, I mean, I'm not arguing that uh, Russia should be isolated, that there should be no dialogue. I think there should be a dialogue and the line of contact should be opened. But any accommodation or understanding or even more so normalizing uh, uh, Putin and his regime, that's uh, something that should be done. Because actually that's what he cares a lot about, uh, uh, becoming back as a normal part, a member of international community. And he is not. And he should be reminded about that at every corner, that what he did to Ukraine and still doing to Ukraine makes him a cry. Uh, I think that's my position. That's the position of many of us in Ukraine. Uh, most finally, there is a military assistance. And just a few days ago, I think, there was another package uh, allocated for 250 million. Uh, and uh, there is a talk, maybe, about more little weapons being delivered to Ukraine from this country. We'll see. Uh, the javelins are there. It's not really a game changer. It's not something that would allow Ukraine to win the war against Russia. That never was the rationale, and a lot of people just misunderstood that. Uh, but it's something meaningful, though, uh, uh, in symbolic uh, sense, primarily, because Ukrainians, Ukrainians want to know and understand that they are standing there not alone, not just vis-a-vis -vis this asymmetric conflict with Russia, that we're getting some support. And I'm concluding here. Elections are coming up in Ukraine, as uh, uh, Alexei has mentioned already, and I'm, I'm sure that maybe Volodymyr will <laughs> probably mention that as well in his presentation. Uh, a lot of people in Ukraine are jockeying for US support, but of course, as always, I think Washington should refrain from putting any stakes or bets or any eggs in one basket. They should uh, really stand up for the principles, for the right thing, for the, for the election process to be free and fair. It would be regrettable if there would be some uh, regress in that in Ukraine's elections because we haven't seen any administrative resource, for instance, being uh, implemented in Ukraine's uh, elections anytime uh, recently. Uh, and that will be uh, something uh, for US administration observers also to watch out for, uh, that Ukraine remains uh, a, a democracy, maybe a flawed democracy, maybe sometimes a messy democracy, but at the same time, there will be no violation of the free and fair uh, election process. Thank you. Our fourth uh, presenter is Volodymyr Kulik from uh, Kuras Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies in Kiev. And he will talk about religion and geopolitics. Kiev and Moscow clash over the Constantinople Patriarchy's decision on Ukrainian autocephaly. Thank you, Maria. Thank, uh, thank you, all, all of you, for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist in religion or religious politics, and uh, to me it's uh, part of an identity politics which I've been studying uh, for, for many years, and this uh, uh, part became uh, prominent rather unexpectedly to all of us, except maybe a narrow circle of people who, who uh, had access to, the, to information about uh, uh, closed-door negotiations. So to us, uh, it became prominent unexpectedly on 17th April, uh, April 2018, when President Poroshenko summoned uh, the leaders of uh, parliamentary factions uh, to tell them that Ukraine was, in his word, as close as ever to obtaining autocephaly for its Orthodox Church, but also ask them to help to achieve this supposedly common goal uh, by uh, um, uh, encouraging or actually pressuring maybe somewhat uh, members of their factions to uh, support the appeal of, of the parliament to consider all the party of Bartholomew. So uh, who uh, is expected, uh, or the patriarchy is expected to, to, to grant this autocephaly? Um, so Ukrainian Church is uh, uh, partly part of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is dependent on, on, on Moscow, and uh, or considerable is of course uh, the, um, the most powerful and most obvious alternative to that uh, center of, of uh, Orthodox power, and uh, it's particularly called 
ecumenical, uh, Zelensky, yes, meaning uh, first among equal, uh, and uh, in, now is, is considerable in Moscow are debating this uh, matters of this uh, equality and pri versus primacy. Yeah, uh, but I will not, not go into the, uh, detail of that. Uh, I would rather I would rather mention uh, the uh, domestic Ukrainian aspects of of, of, of this process uh, and uh, how it uh, may affect domestic Ukrainian politics, but also ge geopolitical dimension, the clash between Moscow. And, and and key, but also involving other foreign foreign um, powers, foreign um, uh, centers. So uh, this appeal Poroshenko uh, called for was adopted by the parliament two days later. In addition to to this, two of the Ukraine main, uh, Ukrainian main Orthodox churches appealed independently to to the uh, Party to grant autocephaly. So given this seemingly broad appeal, even though it excluded one large part of Ukrainian Orthodox, namely that part which is subordinated uh, or loyal to Moscow, uh, it, it could be interpreted as reflecting the general or almost general will of the Ukrainian population, something which was lacking in the past. and, and uh, uh, given the will of, of the patriarch himself to, to interpret it this way, he could start a process which is supposed to lead to actually obtaining autocephaly uh, sometime soon. Uh, so uh, uh, it might lead to, or it's, uh, if we are fortunate, uh, might lead to the unification of Ukrainian Orthodox, which are currently, uh, who are currently divided between three denominations. Uh, or might produce even a greater divide and maybe and, and, and maybe some some even clashes. So um, Corey Welt uh, inquired me in private in, 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 in the break asking, oh, I wanted to ask you well, whether you dare do that. Uh, maybe it, it will become even worse, even more dangerous. You know, I, my, my answer is yes, and I will try to, to explain why. Uh, so autocephaly uh, as, a, as a goal, as, a, as something uh, cherished, didn't start in April this year. It, was, it, it has been cherished by many, but by no means all, Ukrainian clergymen and intellectuals and politicians uh, since the early years of independence. Uh, not only for religious purposes, but for, 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 nat for national or nationalist, if you wish, purposes as an important attribute of nationhood. Yeah, each nation uh, has its own church, why not us? Yeah? If, if, if Serbia can, if, uh, if Greece can, if uh, Georgia can, why not us? Yeah? Uh, and of course, part of the answer is colonial or imperial history, but then again, Georgians also have it, and then if, if Estonia, a tiny Estonia with, with its Orthodox minority can have uh, its Orthodox Church recognized by Constantinople again, why not us? Yeah? Uh, so, just two months after uh, uh, proclamation of independence, uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, by then uh, autonomous part of Moscow Patriarchy, appealed to its mother church uh, to grant uh, uh, full autocephaly. Uh, basically, that was encouraged by the state uh, leadership uh, as part of preparation uh, anticipation for popular referendum. So if, if that had been achieved by that time, it would, of course, have boosted the chances of, 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 of the Ukrainian leadership under Kravchuk to, to, to get this independence proclaimed by the parliament supporting a popular referendum. But Moscow at that time postponed the decision and later effectively blocked it. So uh, and, and focused on, on, on uh, prosecution and, and, and denunciation of, of the main driving force behind that uh, move. A metropolitan Filaret, who, who was accused of, of religious uh, schism, um, in response. Filaret, who, who, is, who is a real fighter, uh, uh, went on uh, with, with support of Kravchuk to, to establish an independent uh, church called uh, Kiev, Ukrainian Orthodox Church Kiev Patriarchy, and um, uh, with, with a wish to, 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 again, to get the main church, the United Church, which he failed to achieve, but he, he failed to, to, uh, to establish a church as a powerful competitor to the Moscow uh, loyal church, but not as a main dominant church. And then there was a, uh, 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 there was two as there were two aspects. One was canonical recognition, so that church was not recognized by any other Orthodox church, Orthodox church as, as, a, as, a, as a legitimate church, and that was a main barrier for many true believers, rather than kind of nationalist practitioners, yeah, uh, to, to join the church, because if it's not recognized, it's not, it's not a true church, yeah. Um, 
and um, uh, 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 also uh, there was a kind of ideological opposition in many parts of Ukraine, primarily among Russian speakers in the East and South. And there, the, the, uh, there was also a small part uh, of the uh, 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 self-proclaimed autocephalous church, which, which uh, remained independent, did not join with this Kiev patriarchy. So we had, we had three churches uh, called Orthodox. Uh, they, they differed by their standing in different regions uh, and under different presidents. I will not go into detail. But uh, uh, what I will focus on in, in this three minutes left, which Maria shows me gracefully, uh, is, um, is how they changed after Euromaidan and the outbreak of the war. So these churches, Kiev Patriarchy and Autocephalus Church, Kiev Patriarchy being more, more prominent, more influential of the two, um, were perceived as national churches. And that's why their popular support, subjective identification with them, far exceeded uh, their capacity uh, uh, for service. Uh, uh, so the number of parishes, the number of monasteries, the minor, minor number of uh, clergymen, yeah? So they were, uh, they were allied with much uh, greater than their capacity warranted, uh, in contrast to Moscow Patriarchy, which was uh, more infrastructurally powerful than, than popular uh, in, 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 in survey data. And, and, that, and that changed even more, that, uh, this, this gap uh, widened even more after Euromaidan and the war. Uh, mo this Moscow Loyal Church was perceived to be uh, like another uh, uh, fifth column, uh, to, 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 to quote Scott Rennitz. Uh, so they, they refused to clearly ally with, 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 the, with Ukraine in this war. They, they refused to say, yes, it's an aggression of, of Russia against Ukraine. And to many uh, patriotic or nationalist-minded uh, people in Ukraine, it's completely unacceptable. There were uh, many calls for an outright ban of the church. Of course, the government would never do that. But the government was, was more encouraging this situation to pursue the goal of autocephaly than before that. Yeah? And that's, that's not, that's, that doesn't suffice, you know, it's one thing you want to achieve autocephaly, another thing you, you, you can achieve that, yeah? And why can you achieve now, why this achievement is more likely than, than before? Uh, because primarily uh, there is greater unity in, in Ukrainian political class, there is opposition to that, but, but, but more unity, uh, which uh, Konserobov can work on. But there is also, importantly, a greater willingness on the part of uh, Konserobov Patriarchy itself to, to, to pursue that goal because of, of the supposedly unfriendly moves by Moscow, um, mostly manifested in, in Moscow Patriarch's uh, refusal to uh, to participate in this uh, Orthodox Council in, in, in Krakow in 2016, uh, uh, then uh, perception that winning this ally with, three, uh, with, uh, with 30 million believers would be would be beneficial to Constantinople in its uh, cont uh, uh, controversy and its rivalry with, 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 with Moscow, and also uh, some, some personal issue the part here might, might have uh, uh, regarding, regarding Moscow. Uh, and also he is believed to be willing to listen to what uh, Turkish authorities under, under whose jurisdiction he is operating tell him. And now they are less likely to pressure him to, 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 to listen to Moscow. So for all these factors, which are hard to verify but widely speculated on, it is believed that much, much likely that, that, that this decision will be made. Actually, part of that uh, was already announced. Uh, the, uh, uh, there, there was a delegation by, by, by the Constantinople uh, to, uh, to Ukrainian celebration of, of the anniversary of, 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 of baptism of U uh, Ukraine rules. Well, then the, uh, there was an Orthodox uh, Council in Constantinople in early September. Uh, then there was a, the, the two emissaries were, were sent to Ukraine uh, very recently, further ignited Moscow. Moscow has really tried to block it, sending its emissaries to all Orthodox uh, powers, trying to discredit this idea within Ukraine, actually uh, tr trying to, to persuade somehow, I don't know, Brian Bull or whatever, uh, nobody knows for, for sure, uh, uh, Bartholomew himself, but it doesn't seem to be working. So we are on the verge of this decision, which is widely expected to be announced, maybe in October, but at least by the end of the year, yeah? So the crucial question, what happens? Uh, how many of uh, these Moscow loyal clergymen will defect, and whether it produces a domino effect, 
whether this Moscow Little Church will remain a powerful, uh, the most powerful, at least one of the most powerful uh, churches in Ukraine, uh, how strongly it will continue uh, aligned with, with, with Russia, or maybe it will try to, to, to become, to look more, 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 more Ukrainian patriotic church, and whether finally, and probably most importantly, whether it leads to any violence. And uh, I will only mention this last dimension. I don't believe there will be widespread of violence. Uh, definitely there will be no violence uh, encouraged or called for by the government. Uh, uh, what, what I might not exclude completely is that some nationalist activists, nationalist militias, will try to interfere, especially if they believe that there is no widespread defection, there is no widespread balance of power which they expect. If, 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 if it doesn't happen, they might be frustrated and try to, to kind of to, to impose it well, by, by force, and the government might be, unfortunately, might be unable or even not quite willing uh, to put an end to that, as, as we observe in, in, in some other practices of, of uh, non-state actors, uh, non-state actors' uh, violence. But I, I don't think that's likely, but it's something for us to watch out for and, 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 to, and to keep in mind as, as one possible un 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 unfortunate uh, kind of ramification of these processes which are legitimate and, and, and desired in, so, in their own right, but, but might have these unfortunate effects. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to have uh, comments from our discussant, uh, Sam uh, Cherub from RAND. Thank you. Um, so just uh, as I was listening to these presentations just now, uh, it uh, thought occurs to me you know, that I guess it's sort of obvious, but nonetheless, um, you know, this is a complicated country we're talking about. Right? <laughs> uh, and we shouldn't uh, forget that in terms of the uh, when we when we try to uh, analyze it and avoiding uh, black and white characterizations, I think it's important. Um, and uh, just bearing that in mind. Uh, anyway, uh, beginning with uh, Jordan's paper, um, which uh, presents a very interesting uh, design, at, uh, or a survey design at, and laboratory experiment design at getting at a, um, uh, a, a, a question that has direct policy implications, particularly for assistance programs, um, as far as US policy is concerned. Uh, and it has um, concrete implications, particularly for the design of messaging campaigns, but more broadly for the effectiveness of efforts to uh, combat corruption and what kind of programming might actually work. Um, uh, so uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from that. Um, I look forward to seeing the, uh, the, the full analysis um, once it's, it's complete. What I was struck by, um, uh, in, a couple of things. Um, first is that we're talking about in the, um, even with the positive uh, uh, messaging, um, in terms of the change from the control group who wasn't shown the positive message, uh, it's about 2% um, less of Ukrainians who uh, say they would be willing to be bribed. Um, and when you take a step back and ask the question, are messaging campaigns, generally speaking, um, worth the uh, effort if we're talking about a 2% a, uh, a um, decrease in, or let, let's put it this way, that it affected, uh, it has a potential to affect 2% of the population, or uh, decrease 2% willingness of respondents to, uh, to engage in this activity. Um, and then also you sort of you see, uh, and uh, Jordan alluded to this, this, uh, it, this far more modest difference in the laboratory experiment with um, the students asked to play bureaucrats versus those asked to play citizens in terms of willingness to accept bribes. Um, and so I'd be interested to know uh, if Jordan uh, has any views as to why uh, only 3% less of the um, role-playing bureaucrats uh, had a change of heart, um, or uh, had a different approach, I guess, uh, in this context. Um, uh, it's it's counterintuitive, I suppose. Um, and I guess more broadly, uh, is, uh, th it does raise the question as to, you know, if the objective of uh, these programs is presumably to affect social behavior, uh, to make uh, Ukrainians less likely to give and take bribes, is uh, messaging the, the best tool to, to do that. Um, and so I guess uh, the end results of the research will have some direct implications 
uh, for that question. Um, in terms of Alexei's paper, uh, it's an, uh, uh, and he didn't get into this as much, in as much detail in his presentation as he did in the written product, uh, which will be I assume, forthcoming from Bonars. Uh, it's an excellent dissection of a lot of the failings of, of the Parzhenko administration in the last um, five years, uh, at which he mentioned, he characterized in his presentation as a, uh, as a zigzag. Another term often used uh, for this is muddling through. Um, and it raises the question if that is viable for another five years, um, if, if that is essentially the default outcome that we're likely to face from, the, from this presidential election. Uh, uh, can, can, can the muddling through continue indefinitely? I'm interested in his take on that. Um, and then all of the informal uh, system of uh, um, arrangements that Poroshenko has, uh, has established, that Alexei describes in the paper, um, what, what happens to all of those if he loses? Um, and particularly with, uh, as Alexei mentioned, a candidate in Tomoshenko who uh, might try to monopolize power, uh, is this uh, potentially um, disruptive in a, uh, in a destabilizing way? Um, and uh, I'd be also interested in his views on, um, Alexei's views on the implication currently of the relatively extreme unpopularity of all the candidates. We're talking about almost single digits for uh, um, almost everyone. The, the, the leaders are in the low double digits. Um, and I'd be interested also, Alexei uh, outlines a number of ways in which the Kremlin might use uh, media resources to have influence in this campaign. If we compare this presidential campaign or the forthcoming parliamentary campaign to previous presidential and parliamentary campaigns, particularly the ones before uh, the Maidan Revolution, um, one would assume that the, uh, the levers, the informational levers available to Russia are actually quite diminished from what they were before. Uh, and not only just informational, I mean levers of influence more broadly. Uh, presumably there are, uh, there are now fewer parties that, uh, that uh, uh, are um, amenable to such influence. There are uh, fewer people willing to vote for them uh, that are under the Ukrainian government's control. Um, and so whether we're now uh, in, a, in a period where um, the ability of uh, the Kremlin to influence outcomes has, uh, by dint of their own actions, decreased compared to before, even that doesn't make it unimportant. It's just a, a question of relative uh, ability to influence. Um, and uh, the other issue uh, I'd be interested in hear hearing him weigh in on is uh, the messaging of the main candidates themselves. Um, we saw in the end some of this very interesting polling data on attitudes towards a settlement. Uh, it does seem that particularly uh, the two uh, leaders in the polls, um, uh, Poroshenko and Timoshenko, are, are trying to outdo each other in hawkishness. Uh, and um, whether or not that might have some uh, impact on what might occur after the election, given that it's not exactly creating fertile ground for uh, any sort of compromise, one would imagine. Um, the first Volodymyr's paper, uh, moving on. Uh, it, uh, it does, uh, uh, on, uh, on the Trump administration's approach to Ukraine, uh, highlights a very interesting paradox about US foreign policy in the last, um, couple of years about uh, a, a surprising continuity, um, arguably a hardening, uh, contrary to expectations before the Trump administration <laughs> took office. Um, and, uh, and he offers some uh, compelling explanations as to why uh, there was continuity when so much change was expected, and particularly the role of personalities lower than the level of the president and, uh, and, and bureaucracies, institutions. Um, there is a broader question, though, uh, and uh, which is, you know, what exactly are the objectives of U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine these days, um, uh, and which sometimes is not entirely clear, even to those of us who follow it pretty closely. Uh, are we, are, are there a, a concrete objective being pursued? Um, you know, the the question that uh, Volodymyr brought up about the, the javelin sale is a good example since they're being housed under lock and key on the other side of the country from the uh, conflict zone, one would assume that they're not, they haven't been sent to affect the military balance as a result. 
uh, and uh, nor are anti-tank weapons uh, the, at the top of the list of um, uh, things one would do if one wanted to um, provide assistance in rebuilding uh, defense capabilities in Ukraine. So uh, is this just symbolism? And if so, um, that's, a, that's an important thing to note. Um, on uh, the, uh, perhaps one um, uh, issue that, uh, that uh, you might want to consider as well, Vladimir, is uh, the extent to which uh, U.S. domestic politics is, is um, uh, determinative here, or, or mm -hmm. at least plays a significant role. Um, uh, the, it's sort of a byproduct of the politicization of Russia policy, perhaps, but um, it would seem to me that this administration uh, has little room for maneuver on Ukraine because any change would be seen as, you know, caving to Russia. Um, and uh, under the circumstances, I think uh, that would be a, uh, at least one would assume seen as self-harm. Um, and then finally, on this question of uh, supporting candidates in, uh, in, uh, in the election or not, I think one element that we're witnessing and we have witnessed for several years now with uh, uh, President Poroshenko is that whether or not the U.S. openly supports him, he's uh, uh, draping himself in the American flag at times and, uh, and acting as if that support exists. And um, I wonder if uh, what sort of challenge that presents to U.S. policy and whether uh, Vladimir had any thoughts about how it might adjust to those circumstances, given his own unpopularity. Um, that is not Volodymyr's, of course, but uh, <laughs> Poroshenko's. Um, uh, Volodymyr, <laughs> much higher. <laughs> I'm sure. It doesn't take much, though. It's really fair. Uh, Volodymyr Kulik's paper on the, on the uh, impending, uh, it seems, autocephaly of the Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church. Um, some very interesting data in there, particularly on the number of parishes and, and, and on public opinion. Uh, strikingly, as of 2012, the, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Moscow Patriarchy, has had uh, 12,230 parishes, um, which I think uh, underscores the stakes here. And uh, Volodymyr does an excellent job of presenting, uh, as dispassionately as one can, uh, the uh, history of this uh, complex and um, uh, at times politically charged issue. Um, I wonder, uh, though, and Volodymyr ended his presentation on, on a hopeful note that uh, unless um, sort of elements within the uh, nationalist vanguard get out of hand, that the that the authorities won't themselves be uh, seeking to uh, if manage this uh, process and uh, well do, to do so and, and avoid violence. In fact, he he writes in the written paper that uh, you know if force were to be employed to to take the uh, Moscow <coughs> patriarchy. Uh, uh, parishes um, over once this autocephaly is granted, uh, that could not only provoke social tension within Ukraine, but also encourage Moscow to escalate its military intervention, and therefore it's safe to assume that the Ukrainian authorities will not engage in such activities. Well, I wonder how safe that assumption is, uh, in that we've seen um, uh, some activities that uh, provoke social tension and encourage Moscow to escalate its military intervention at various points over the last um, several years uh, and um, uh, doesn't seem to uh, uh, be uh, uh, taboo, that is, for the, for the Ukrainian authorities to engage in such behavior. And particularly because it's now become part of uh, the president's re-election campaign uh, mm, agenda to emphasize this, uh, the independence of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And uh, I'd be interested in Volodymyr's take, uh, broadly speaking, is, uh, is achieving autocephaly now, timing of course is important, a good thing or a bad thing uh, from a perspective of Ukraine's uh, social cohesion, political stability, and uh, the prospects for a settlement of the conflict um, in the East. Thank you, Sam. I'll uh, give the presenters a chance to respond. Thank you, Sam, for the comments. Uh, let me break up two issues that I think 
touch on, on the questions you raised, because I think they're related but separate. One is, how do you know what an effective anti-corruption policy is in the real world, and what would we consider worth it? Um, and obviously that depends on how much it costs to do something. And the other is, how do you go from something artificial like a survey or survey experiment or a laboratory experiment and say, okay, well, that says 2% here, what's that mean in the real world? Because I think your questions get at both of these, but they're, they're somewhat distinct. Now, with respect to the first one, uh, at Northwestern, a <laughs> not long ago did an interdisciplinary review for USAID on anti-corruption policies, and I was really disturbed by, by two things. One is how little we know about what works, and two is how little that we do know seems to work. <laughs> and, and so, um, and in three, I guess, third thing, not just two, third thing that really disturbed me was how we don't even really seem to know how to, to figure out what the definition of working is when we're fighting corruption. Um, and so, you know, ideally, I think in a lot of people's minds when we talk about fighting corruption, there's a sense that like we can actually have this dramatic situ you know, uh, solution like we had in, in Hong Kong, and obviously in the part of the world that many people here are interested, Georgia is the closest thing to doing something like that. But those types of instances are extremely rare. So a lot of success stories in the literature are about these changes that really are like a six percent decline in municipal corruption based on a new audit program that Brazil is doing or something <coughs> like that, and that's considered quite large. And so whether you think that's large or not depends on a lot of relative factors. Uh, if it's in the case of you know, saving of an 8% reduction in fraud in a municipal budget, that might actually be pretty good. So I, so I think it's really hard, and I certainly don't have an easy answer to this question, but I think that's part of what you're getting at and has to be addressed is, what does it mean? If we get 5%, um, again, it's not a 5% reduction, so you know, it's, in this case, it's 2 percentage points reduction, it's 13% less people in, 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 the, in the minimum estimates there are saying I would give a bribe. Um, you know, if, if, if you can get a certain you know, percentage, is that enough for you? If you don't have to spend very much money for it, maybe. I don't have a solution to that. Uh, but the other side is how do you go from something artificial like this, this to understanding what the real changes are? And, and that's trickier, but I would just emphasize this, that to me, I'd put it this way. I showed that to people for less than 30 seconds. I mean, they could look at it as long as they wanted. But that's just somebody looking at this for, for a couple of seconds. To me, it's amazing it has any effect. I mean, it wouldn't affect me. Um, and, and so I was quite shocked. And beyond that, to the extent that information experiments have an impact, they're supposed to have an impact in places where they're, they're introducing some new information. In a place where you have deeply embedded norms and understandings of something like Ukraine, I was even less expecting to get results. Because if you tell the Ukrainians, change your views about corruption, I was pretty sure, based on the pilot, that either people would say you're lying, because we're just trying to convince them that you know, corruption's going down. People would say, no, it's not true. I don't believe this information. Uh, or they just have some sort of gut reaction against you. So um, I think if you put it in that respect, this is artificial, but the fact that it has any impact is interesting. And then you have to go from there and say, how do we expand that to know whatever matter in the real world? Very quickly, one final thing about the bureaucrats versus citizens. Um, again, it's a limited laboratory environment, so I would have caution about drawing too much from it, but I, I think there's two possibilities. Uh, the substantive one would be that flyers are aimed towards citizens. And so, I mean, I think that, it, you know, that would be the optimistic interpretation is that students actually got something out of these fly flyers that, that thought we as Ukrainian citizens, not we as Ukrainian bureaucrats. And you need to craft the message for bureaucrats. Uh, the more methodological or, or less optimistic interpretation would be just that the students can't identify with being a bureaucrat in the same way they can identify with being a bribe giver, which is possibly, sadly, even a situation they've been in already, even at, you know, 18, 21 years old. Um, so that's another possibility, but I'm honestly not sure at this point. But thanks so much for the comments. So, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, default, I think default is not likely. I think that the uh, Ukrainian government understands it's important to receive an IMF loan and will make uh, and will increase uh, communal tariffs, which may make a backfire at the ele during the election campaign, but there would be uh, financial stability. Uh, we Ukraine uh, witness modest economic growth, 3.5%, uh, and likely it will continue. Um, Timoshenko is perceived by civil society activists and by many exper experts as a threat regarding uh, attempts to monopolize power. That's true. Uh, as I have said, uh, 
potentially there would be counterbalance during parliamentary elections because, again, neither civil society nor oligarchs, they would not like to have a person who will monopolize power, okay? So a lot would depend on the parliamentary uh, elections and rec reconfiguration of power after, after parliamentary elections. But in this situation, Poroshenko actually is viewed again by many experts and civil society activists as lesser evil. So, and actually he's gonna to capitalize, capitalize on that. It gives him a chance despite his unpopularity. Um, regarding Russian influence, I fully agree with you actually. And it's very good that you raise this issue. Russian influence in general definitely diminished. However, they still retain uh, leverages, including the situation at the front line because they may escalate situation, de-escalate, and by doing it to regulate temperature within Ukrainian, Ukrainian society. And so we are coming to the issue of uh, criticism to Poroshenko, because Poroshenko is, was viewed as too, actually too mild in this issue, not harsh, but too mild. Let's, let's remember that before the so-called uh, economic blockade, Poroshenko actually uh, established the model of dealing with the occupied regions, a model like it was existing, like it's existing in Transnistria. Actually, there was continuation of trade. Uh, and you have people, humanitarian contacts, and, uh, but he was widely criticized for that, and the, from below from society. And the argument was simple. You cannot have business with them as usual because this business is built on blood. So the demand uh, for, of economic blockade actually came against Poroshenko's, uh, Poroshenko's policy. As a result, then there was reaction of Ukrainian government, re uh, reaction by LNR, DNR, supported by Russia, and as a result, we see now formal economic blockade. But we need to understand that also it's called a blockade. Uh, every day, 30,000 citizens are crossing the line, every day. And they are bringing goods and foods from Ukrainian side. So it's not an economic blockade in full sense of, of this word. And regarding the slogans during the campaign, well, both Tymoshenko and Poroshenko, they will use, you know, some patriotic slogans, no concessions, and so on and so forth. But uh, again, it doesn't mean that Ukraine is going to conduct a military operation, <coughs> vice versa. Vice versa, so we are not ready for that, we are not preparing for that, actually, it's understood, and it's understood by Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian political class, it's not possible to win a war by, by military means, and that's why actually what is supported by Ukrainian population is uh, mission of international peacekeepers with potential establishing transitional administration in this uh, in these areas. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for your comments, and uh, let me address them uh, quickly because we need to have some time for Q&A as well. Uh, in terms of uh, objectives of U.S. policy towards Ukraine, uh, there's no consensus, <laughs> and I don't think that any uh, one has a, a definite answer to this question. Uh, clearly, with this administration, it's even more confusing because uh, there been a number of stories in the press out there that Trump actually talked to his advisors uh, saying, remind me please again, why Why are we supporting Ukraine? Why is it important? And they, I, I guess they're doing a pretty decent job <laughs> in, in explaining that to President once in a while, but the very fact that he needs this kind of convincing and explaining, uh, that's uh, quite telling. In that respect, he is uh, similar to an average American, I think, uh, you know, who, <laughs> who also would like to know like, why would the country like Ukraine uh, matter to us, and that's, uh, that's how it is. So there's no consensus, and then again, there is an establishment, uh, which is much more in line with this traditional inertia of, uh, of uh, conservative slash liberal moderate approach uh, to the foreign policy, and they understand better why Ukraine matter. 
Uh, well, uh, uh, there is a war that uh, uh, um, I think that uh, America wouldn't like to for Ukraine to lose. Uh, uh, you know, so that the Russia would be kind of winning or imposing its will on Ukraine in many ways. It's not that uh, ever uh, any of the previous administration and, and this one were in the business of maintaining this balance of power in post-Soviet space. I don't think that ever was a notion really of the tug of war between US and Russia, which is a popular notion in Russia, but also in Ukraine, that there is this big power struggle around Ukraine between these countries of uh, major powers, like one being US and another Russia. I never bought these explanations and this model, these theories, but, but at the same time, what Russia is doing in Ukraine is also showing a middle finger to, to Washington. And I don't think people in Washington like that. I mean, whoever is in power, so there is a, there is a need to somehow react to this. Um, there is a need also to help reforms, because actually if Ukraine models through, if Ukraine has even a modest success with reforms and fighting corruption, uh, that would mean that American support uh, and assistance uh, matters and, uh, and it helps. And also getting back to this uh, idea of the international order being broken by Russian aggression against Ukraine, Again, it probably doesn't mean much to President Trump because he actually doesn't like this international order, existing one, and he's going around and breaking uh, things into pieces, and then uh, other people below him are uh, rushing behind him and trying to glue those pieces back <laughs> into the whole object, so to speak, and remedy the impact of what President is doing. But uh, So the establishment definitely understands that the international order where the leadership role of the US was encrusted for decades means something, and that's where Ukraine uh, yeah, matters. Uh, I think I fully understand how U.S. domestic element is important here in terms of understanding uh, or what sort of policy this country is pursuing towards Ukraine ever since Trump came to White House. Finally, I don't see the support for Poroshenko at the expense of other candidates. There was a lot of conspiracy theories, like I say, joking, you know, Timoshenko rushed here for the, to, to meet president early on in the, uh, the national uh, prayer breakfast in the lobby there, and then she said, uh, you know what, I was the first one, the president was incensed with that. <laughs> and then uh, other conspiracy theorists, uh, Vakarchuk, for instance, spent some, high, some time here in the US, and then Ukrainians and others begin to say, oh, he is actually the American guy, you know, whoever is American guy, American lady, I mean, I don't think it should be really part of American approach to Ukraine. Uh, what they should be interested in is about the, the election process being democratic, orderly, transparent, there will be no violations or limited, <coughs> decent amount of violations, no widespread violations. And that should be really a position uh, for the Washington you know, in upcoming elections, in my view. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Sam. You, uh, as I see it, you, you make two points uh, uh, need in response. Uh, first, about uh, or why should this prospect of um, escalation and uh, internal tension uh, stop Poroshenko from, um, or the government more generally, from, from um, uh, conducting some activities um, <coughs> which you argue have been also conducted in, in the past? You did not uh, refer specifically what activities to keep in mind, probably the communization, I don't know, maybe uh, some um, uh, language issues, but what I believe is uh, there is difference between provoking grievances in parts of the population and provoking riots, you know, um, provoking large-scale protests, yeah, and uh, Yanukovych, Yanukovych would, would, would explain to, 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 to any of us uh, uh, why the difference is important, yeah? Uh, 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 so, uh, definitely, uh, uh, some activities uh, of the uh, current Ukrainian government provoke, uh, provoked uh, grievances or dissatisfaction on the part of the population. Some reforms and some refra uh, refraining from reforms. You know, some 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 failure to reform. Yeah, some 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 argue decommunization was too much. So, uh, so, some argue uh, failure to Ukraine uh, uh, adopt a new language law was too much. Some say uh, uh, there was too much break with Russia. Some say there was way too little break with Russia. Yeah. So, but uh, the point is, none of this uh, none of these activities or lack of activities provoke large scale uh, protests. Yeah. Uh, even such uh, supposedly sweeping reforms as decommunization. And what I'm saying that if the government resorted to a uh, sizable uh, scale of violence to, 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 to take churches from Moscow patriarchy, that could actually provoke 
not just silent grievances or grudging uh, disapproval, you know, but actually uh, protests in the street and actually clashes and so on. So, and, and, and that's something which the prospect of which will, will, uh, I believe will definitely stop uh, the government from, from even dreaming of that. Yeah? Not that I'm saying they are great. Uh, second, uh, uh, whether this is good or bad to, to, to do that uh, now, uh, uh, in view of this potential uh, kind of danger, so whatever ramifications. And again, if I were uh, if I were certain or, or almost certain that these negative consequences, like large scale protests and, and, and clashes in the streets, would be likely, then I would say no, <coughs> let's not do that. But since I believe them, uh, uh, consider them to be. Uh, highly unlikely, I, I believe that's a good time as any, because after the election, you might have a very different government. You know, this relatively pro-Western and, and, and reformist con constellation of, 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 of the authorities was paid for and is being paid for by blood. And, we, and, and it is appreciated by, by active part of the population, but this is an active minority. And the silent or grudging majority is, is growing increasingly tired with the, with the cause they are paying, even though they are not actually spilling blood, yeah, but, but, they are, but, but they are maybe not achieving as much uh, kind of uh, as high a living standard as, as they would like, or they believe that they, they could have something, yeah, not exactly clear what. Uh, they have visa-free regimes, they, they, they have modest economic growth, they, they have currency stability at a time of war, they have a lot of things. But, but they believe that they, they, they have corruption and, and, and Doroshenko's son is not fighting a war. Yeah? So some of them have enough of that to, 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 to consider that everything is bad. And we see, we see data. They are believing that everything is bad. Yeah? The, the huge majority is believing that things are going in the wrong direction. Ukrainians are not good at believing the great leader. We saw the data today that uh, Russians believe that it was not, 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 not good to interfere with Syria and then uh, when the great leader uh, told them it, it, it should be done, they, they said yes, uh, uh, it, it is a good thing. Ukrainians are reacting the opposite way. Uh, if, if the government is doing something, they start questioning them and, and, and maybe even protesting against that. But I believe such things which are uh, good for Ukrainian independence, for Ukrainian human rights, for Ukrainian uh, Western anchoring, should be done whenever uh, there is an opportunity to achieve that. When, whenever there is least opposition in the, on the par, uh, 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 level of power and on the level of the population, yeah? And now, of course, on the level of the front line. But uh, I believe this is something we can and should, uh, and should achieve in this time frame. Thank you. Uh, we have some uh, time for uh, questions, and let's uh, do three at a time uh, so that we can uh, have as many as possible. Let's, and please introduce yourself. My name is David Donofeu, again, first year Elliot student. My question is to Mr. Kulik. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin has been actively using the Russian Orthodox Church in order to sort of like create this um, atmosphere of Russian national sentiment. And my question is um, twofold. The first one is, how independent is His Holiness Peter Kirill from the power of the Kremlin? And the second one is, you know, um, His Holiness Bartholomew. How, um, how influential is he as first among equals in the Orthodox world? Wayne Mary, uh, don't want to take much time. I would put my theologian's hat for a moment. Uh, Bartholomew's recent statement bears careful reading. It's only two pages, but you should read it in the, the full statement. It says less about autocephaly than it says about Moscow patriarchs' canonical historical claims in Ukraine, which Bartholomew rejects. Now, Bartholomew is ecumenical patriarch. He's not patriarch of Constantinople. He's Archbishop of Constantinople is primus under part under pars of the 14 autocephalous patriarchates. He has no authority to raise an autonomous church to autocephalous status. None. Nor does, nor does he claim it. He has the power on behalf of his own patriarchate to recognize another church as autocephalous. But in the same way that the Russian government's recognition of the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia don't make them independents, in orthodoxy, autocephaly is a matter of both form and substance. 
The reason Bartholomew has resisted this is because he understands the competing churches in Ukraine are create a particularly challenging and potentially messy situation. What he has done recently is to reject the pressure from Kirill to recognize and accept the Moscow Patriarch's claims in Ukraine, which he has explicitly said are historically false. He has not sought to encourage any believer or parish in Ukraine to do anything. So do you have a question? Yeah, so the beginning of this process is still one that will take place within Ukraine. The ecumenical patriarch is trying to be a good spiritual steward, but he is not trying to provoke anybody to do anything. What he is doing is resisting bullying from Moscow, in my review, quite correctly. One more. Kathy Cosmo, but also on the same subject. Um, the stakes for the Moscow Patriarchate are extremely high um, because if, you, if a considerable number of Ukrainians change their allegiance to independent churches in Ukraine or not, you know, outside the Moscow Patriarchate, the Moscow Patriarchate will no longer be the largest church in the Orthodox world. I mean, I think that's a key point. And obviously that has a very important uh, side effect or maybe not side effects, not the right word, but aspect relating to Putin's general uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Orthodox world and not just the Orthodox world. And finally, um, while I may be very sympathetic personally to the autocephalic, you know, autocephalic status <laughs> of the um, yeah, the patriarchy, I have major questions about Filaret because he, uh, well, maybe, maybe you, you Okay, let's uh, give a chance. <laughs> yeah. to, to okay, thank you. So uh, uh, it seems like all three questions are addressed to me. I, I will I will beautifully uh, answer them, but I encourage people after that to to to, to, to engage with with other speakers. Not in your food, no. The quota for on that topic has been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm always speaking uh, either about language or or politics or history or something like uh, engage everybody and, and recognizing everybody and so on. So, uh, how an, uh, uh, independent is, uh, is Kirill uh, from Kremlin? I believe he's not independent at all. That's part of the Russian reality uh, Putin, uh, Putin created. He, he doesn't allow anybody to, to be fully independent. And those who, who, who try, like Navalny, he, yeah. he prosecutes uh, uh, fiercely yeah? and, and rather effectively. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 and that's what's different uh, uh, from Ukraine. Poroshenko has to leave this uh, rather independent churches. This uh, uh, leader of Moscow Loyal Orthodox Church refused to stand up when the, when the parliament was, was, uh, was uh, keeping a minute of silence for, for the fallen uh, uh, soldiers in, in the front line, and they were sitting and said, they survive. They, they still are leaders of the of one of the most influential uh, uh, religious organizations in, in Ukraine. So that's the reality of a pluralistic society versus uh, versus uh, hegemonic, autocratic, or whatever you call it, society. Uh, how influential uh, is Bartholomew? It's it, it's 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 a different uh, question. I'm not well equipped to answer that because I'm not a specialist in in, in religion. But I believe uh, 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 that's that's not a constant. That's changing depending on on how pressured he is. By, uh, by by Turkish authorities, how uh, um, other influential world players, including the U.S., can uh, 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 are, are trying to affect him? How e uh, e eager is he to uh, to, to keep uh, all partnership with other Orthodox leadership, including Moscow, maybe primarily Moscow? So, but. Uh, Obviously, now he believes that he is influential enough to, to afford doing that. What, what, what he is, what, what he seems to be uh, uh, determined to do. Uh, his statement. Uh, you should not only look at one statement by, by himself. You should look. You, you should look at documents of of of, of, of statements uh, of uh, uh, people speaking on behalf of the uh, uh, his patriarchy, like including these two emissaries uh, he, he sent to Ukraine, and including people who who who, who are 
are occasionally expressing some opinions like, uh, like after this Orthodox Council in early uh, uh, in early uh, uh, September, this uh, uh, Metropolitan Emmanuel of France, or uh, and, and so on. So basically, this statement. Uh, uh, refuting Moscow's claim uh, to uh, Ukraine and, and, and Moscow's uh, uh, challenging of uh, considerable right to, uh, to grant or to, uh, uh, or, or, or to uh, take, take, uh, take care of, of Ukrainian believers is kind of a uh, paving ground for autocephaly because U Ukraine is now not recognized by Constantinople as uh, part of, of, of Moscow Church. You, uh, Mos Constantinople is claims that it, it never conceded yeah, this right. right to Moscow, yeah. that is it kept it all along, even though not uh, did not implement for a while, did not exercise this, this right. So that's a precondition for doing whatever they consider right and they can refer to the will of Ukrainian believers, which was, as I, as I mentioned, expressed in, in the appeal from two of Orthodox churches and from the, uh, from the president and from the parliament. So uh, the, 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 the road is open. They, they, whether or not they, they, they go the full way, it's, 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 a, it's a different story, but uh, uh, they, they can do that. Uh, the process will have to, uh, to, to, play, uh, to take place within Ukraine. It does take place within Ukraine. As I mentioned, what, what, what has been done within Ukraine uh, to encourage, to appeal to him, to urge him to, uh, to continue this process. So th there was a beginning within Ukraine. Uh, um, finally, of course, the stakes are high uh, for Moscow, but about Filaret. Filaret is, of course, a, a divisive figure, a polarizing figure. For many, even, even for many people within uh, a considerable patriarchy, the fact that Filaret is most likely to be the head of this new church is a, uh, is a reason to, 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 to pose, to think whether it's, it's a good idea to do it now while he's still alive. He's uh, 89, I believe. So, so uh, some people can say maybe, maybe, maybe we'll wait until he's no longer here. Yeah, but those are in minority, definitely. Uh, so they accept that he will be for a while maybe kind of uh, enjoying this popularity of the first leader of the U U U Ukrainian Orthodox Church, but the price achieving this unity of autocephaly is more important than giving him his five minutes of satisfaction. Yeah, he, he, he is a polarizing figure. He is definitely driven not only by religious motives, yeah, but also his personal agenda, his kind of maybe vendetta against those who, who, who uh, 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 put this, this an, an atom on him and so on. But that doesn't really matter in historical terms, I would add. Excuse me, may add something to this religious debate that we have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, according to uh, religious, uh, re religious law, canonic tradition, yeah. the Mother Church has the right to give autosophale to part of the church on this territory. So let me give you an example of American Orthodox Church which received the status of autocephaly in 1970, given by Moscow Patriarchy. And it's recognized by Georgian, Bulgarian, Polish, and Czech Orthodox mm -hmm. churches. Four out of 14. Okay? So uh, I think here, when we, we need to understand, will Moscow Patriarchy exist in Ukraine? Yes, it will. No question about that. But at the same right, what is important, and for me it's very simple, that very large Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Kiev, Patriarch, and some other churches will have canonical status. This is, this is logical. Albanian Orthodox Church has can, uh, canonical status. Polish and Ukraine doesn't. There's no logic in that. Let's get some non-religion uh, related questions. <laughs> okay, uh, I have one non-related, non-religious question and then a religious question. So, <laughs> but, uh, for George, um, so, do we think corruption is like smoking or do we think it's like democracy? So if I, like an institutionalized form, and I think it's like democracy, I think it's an institutionalized form, and that if we went around telling people democracy is a good thing and increase their attitudes about democracy, I don't think we'd get democracy, right? There are things that preserve this institution and sustain it and keep it functioning. Um, 
Sorry, that's my phone. Um, and, uh, and so it's not about individual attitudes and individual behavior. It's about an institutional form. So anything that we do to try and change individual attitudes is going to have no effect unless you take apart the institutional form, right? Which in Ukraine is less about bribery than about massive embezzlement from the state budget through various schemes, right? Like that's the core of corruption in Ukraine. On the church and violence, you know, people don't organize around language, but they organize around religion. And so there's a pre-existing set of organizational ties out there that can be mobilized. And particularly with Russian Orthodoxy in places like Ukraine and Belarus, this is a lot of where the sort of the, the more extreme paramilitary forms of organization, civic organizations exist. And I don't think this is gonna go very well if, if it starts to, there's a ready-made set of troops essentially for violence. Uh, if this starts to escalate. No, no I, I mean the groups in Ukraine that are loyal to the Moscow Patriarchate. Ah, okay. Yes. Vladimir Shinkoke, Polytechnic Institute. I have one question to all their colleagues still, but not only to him. Um, uh, in case of uh, the split in the Moscow Patriarchal Church, uh, when uh, the priest is going to stay with Moscow Patriarchal, but the majority of the, his parish is would like to join the new unified of the Cephalus Ukrainian Church, or even not the majority, but a sizable minority, uh, which could be a, a pretty typical situation uh, considering the discrepancy between the identities and the uh, actual uh, allegiance of the, parish, uh, of the parishes, um, uh, how this conflict is going to be solved, by which institution, and could it be a major source of violence, actually? And I have also a question to see Harhan about the channels, Inter, News 1, or 112, and so on. Why exactly do you think that they are following primarily the Russian information line, but not the preferences and attitudes of those uh, pretty sizable minority in Ukraine who are actually skeptical towards Maidan, and according to your own data, they are, can agree on pretty significant compromises, 30% for general and autonomy, 30%, something like 30% for neutral status, 15% for completely any compromise with Russia, and these are, poten these are potential voters for the opposition bloc, for the four life parties, the parties which are actually supported by precisely those oligarchs who own those channels. And in this case, isn't it uh, the, the Russian hand and Russian meddling? It's just an excessive hypothesis. Those owners of those channels have pretty rational um, uh, logic to, 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 to support these preferences, and these are the preferences of their audience. Thanks, Keith. I, I agree with you entirely that changing individual opinions is not going to work. Uh, I, I think, though, that institutionalization, and I do think that something uh, that's institutionalized has both a material aspect in the sense of actually changing hard incentives. Are you going to get caught? What do you get in terms of benefits when you do this? But that there's also an aspect in, in uh, institutionalization, institutionalization that's about expectations. And that's the part where this is an individual. And, and to be clear, I'm not necessarily an advocate of anti-corruption messaging. I just noticed that it's everywhere and got curious what works and so on. Um, so I'm somewhat skeptical, to be clear. Um, but the part to me that seems like it might work is definitely not individual. It's more about the fact that the reason, and I think democracy is very similar in the sense that the, the, the reason democracy works is an expectation that others will buy into democracy. And as soon as you don't believe that others buy into democracy, you stop also thinking maybe it's not worth me to you know, respect this election and so on. And so I think there's something very similar to corruption that's going on. So I buy that this institutionalized. I buy that messaging by itself is definitely not going to do it. I maybe even buy that it's never going to do it even at all, but uh, I do think it's sort of institutionalization is partly about what we believe about others and their actions, and that's the part this maybe could get at. Can I actually use my um, access to the mic and ask you a follow-up? Um, before we move on to more uh, discussion of religion, um, I'm, um, I'm wondering um, whether you have a sense of, of how you might measure uh, whether these effects 
are short term or longer term. Whether it's the type of thing where um, when you're shown some happy images, you're going to feel better, but it's not going to cure your depression kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have some ideas about how it could be done. It'd just be really expensive and really time-consuming. And uh, when you look at the, you know, people who study American politics who do similar work on this type of stuff, and they're kind of incrementally pushing the boundaries of research that started 30 years ago with things that are really basic like this, and then saying, now I'm going to do something that's really going to test. Does it work for, you know, 10 years? Does it work for three months? Um, so eventually, yeah, I do think there's ways to do it, but I think it's very, very, very tough. I, if I can go, one thing that kind of gets this and also ties into what Keith said about what is corruption. Is it bribery or is it really, what really matters is embezzlement. Um, and I agree, in Ukraine, uh, embezzlement's a, a huge part of the issue. But one thing that I think ties these together, when you, when you talk to corrupt bureaucrats, the ones who are, you know, admit that they do things, they also always say, you know, I'm not different than everybody else in Ukraine. And maybe this is just rationalization, right? But there's some truth to this, that bureaucrats feel very much persecuted for saying, whenever I take a bribe, somebody who's not a bureaucrat gave me that bribe. And this is all of us. We all as, in, I mean, I was talking to Ukrainian bureaucrats, but I think this holds for any country, you know, in a place where this is widespread, where it's probably the majority, not a small minority that's involved in it, whether it's bribery or embezzlement, this is something that's beyond just uh, a question of, of those who are in government or out of government. It's both, it's societal, and it's also, I think, beyond high or low, it's both, because the guy who's embezzling now, presumably, wasn't like a squeaky clean, lower level bureaucrat who you know never took little bribes, who got up big and decided, now I'm gonna take the big bribes, um, nor was he a business person who was perfectly clean and went into the government, he went into the government knowing he was gonna take those big bribes, probably, and so I think there's some element where these tie together, um, although exactly how is something that I don't think we understand very well. Well, thank you, thank you for this question. Oh, well, uh, number of people who are in favor of peace at any price is twenty percent, and then there is differentiation regarding different different issues of that. So, what does it mean? It means actually that a lot of people, especially who are close to the front line, they are tired of war. And they would like to do to have anything just stop killings, to have ceasefire finally number one in risk agreements. So well, part of them are still sympathetic to some ideas proposed by Russia. That's true. Some still believe it's better. The numbers are low, but uh, some still believe it's better to live in customs union with Russia, or even to have a military union with Russia. But these people are in minority. They have full right to be represented, they view to be represented in Ukrainian media, and that's what they have. Because you, you can find a lot of experts on many Ukrainian uh, channels and talk shows who present these views, which goes contrary to the official line, which accuse actually Ukrainian government and Poroshenko himself in doing bad things. Uh, so there's no question about it their views are represented in this channel. But what is more important here is that how then to formulate a gender? You can mitigate the risks, or you can increase, deliberately increase, division in Ukrainian society by repeating messages from Kremlin. Maybe this is not so uh, regarding interchannel, which has his own agenda, but definitely about uh, News 1 and 112, and I gave you examples who is controlling them, people who have real direct relations to Putin, translating the, the messages from Kremlin, denying the presence of Russian troops in Ukraine. They say, okay, Russia is helping by military equipment, by uh, military counselors, but, well, we don't know about Russian troops. We haven't seen that. And this is represented by MPs, by uh, other, other people, you know. So that's why I'm pretty sure they are playing into the hands of, of Moscow. That's my answer. No, that, that, that question. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would uh, skip, but uh, it's, it, it's not fair to people asking this question. So. Uh, <laughs> 
two uh, two questions from Keaton Will they were actually um, uh, amount in my uh, in my view to one uh, complex question. Yeah. So uh, how how is, is, is uh, if there is a protest, how is uh, how it will be uh, it should be addressed by the state? How it is likely to be addressed by the state? Let me let me ask uh, start with saying, but I disagree that the people do not organize in our, around language. Sometimes they do. And 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 and, and an example in post-Soviet space is Transnistria. So uh, their protest, their their uh, 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 their, their, their break with, with the Moldovan uh, Republic started with language rather than religion or, 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 or history or whatever. So in some cases uh, there is a large scale uh, or language is a very strong contributing factor to, 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 to a position leading to maybe to even to a civil war, look at Sri Lanka or something. Uh, so uh, what's different about religion? Yes, there is a corporation of people who have invested interest in, in, in that. And sometimes it can be school teachers. Uh, in, in Donetsk, in Donbass in 1993, uh, Russian language teachers were those who had vested interest and were, were on the front line of protests against the perceived forcible Ukrainization. Yeah? So because they would, uh, uh, would lose their, uh, their jobs or so they feared, which, which, which proved untrue. They just allowed to teach Ukrainian language they barely spoke. Yeah? Uh, but uh, uh, here, the state should, in my view, uh, allow any peaceful uh, protest, however determined, however uh, vocal of, 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 of uh, concerned citizens, but put an end to attempts uh, to any uh, organized groups, especially those, uh, those uh, imported from, uh, from Russia, uh, thugs uh, posing as monks, uh, to, uh, to, to violently uh, prevent uh, the state from implementing legal mechanism of resolving this controversy. So, what what kind of, of resolution there, sh there there can be and there should be? Uh, actually, that's nothing new. Uh, dozens of, or maybe hundreds of, uh, of controversies like that on the local level has been uh, registered and, and even uh, analyzed, uh, reported in the media in Ukraine for, for the two decades of independence. The fact that you know little about them means that they did not lead to large scale violence. If there was a violence, it was kind of low level. On, on the local level, it, it never made it to the, to the, national, to the national news. Uh, uh, so it never uh, spilled over beyond that locality to produce some some some, some uh, uh, destabilization even on the regional level, but w w what's usually done is the the, uh, the the alternate services or complete uh, uh, complete uh, closing closure of this one church and and, and they, they they both uh, take their services outside or, or in, in some private houses or something or, or eventually one of, uh, one of the communities build their uh, uh, alternative church building and then the other one is, is using that one. So there are lots of ways to, to, to peacefully uh, or maybe not, this, not, not exactly to everybody's satisfaction but still uh, uh, solve it in such a way as to, as to prevent, uh, to, as to prevent this satisfaction uh, uh, to escalate into violence. And so I believe that should be done. But the government should be clear not to repeat the mistake of, of the spring of, uh, of 2014 when uh, Russo Turisto were allowed to antagonize uh, and, and escalate the, the protest taking place peacefully against the Euromaidan uh, Austin of Yanukovych. Uh, in genuine protest by many Easterners uh, uh, was allowed to, uh, uh, by the state to escalate in, into violent uh, seizure of building and uh, attacks uh, against the, uh, the uh, law enforcement authorities because the state was very weak. I believe the state is no longer that weak and that stupid uh, to allow that to happen, especially that it is to be predicted. Uh, there are places such as, like, for example, Pochayev uh, uh, Lavra, where, where s such people are uh, can be expected to, to to gather, to be prepared to attack if uh, th there is a there is a message uh, 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 to to them to do so from Moscow. Uh, so the state should be prepared and, and, like I said, allow every peaceful protest to take place and, and, and do not allow any violent uh, abuse of, of the citizens' right to, uh, to peacefully protest to, 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 to happen. And, and, and finally, uh, two very, very brief points uh, regarding to, to, to other, uh, to, to other uh, comments. First, about, uh, about muddling through. Uh, there is, a, I believe, a difference between previous period when we had both Reformist and geopolitical muddling through. Now we only have one. Uh, uh, there is no longer geopolitical muddling through, at least, 
at least before the next election, maybe the, the next change will, will, will bring in a, a new president who, who, who will re, re, um, return to, revert to geopolitical modeling through. Uh, maybe Timoshenko is the person to, to expect such a, uh, such a behavior. But, but at least under Poroshenko, there is no uh, geopolitical modeling through. Yes, there is a reformist modeling through, but that's. Uh, in comparative terms, it's progress. Yeah, so uh, however unfortunate to ask who wanted to uh, uh, see the reformist agenda. And, and, and second, uh, with, with, Russia inf with Russia's information and ideological influence, of course, it's, it's weaker now. It cannot be as, uh, as uh, explicit, as bold. But that doesn't mean that there can, cannot be influence, ideological influence achieved by subtle message. And this subtle message can, can, can certainly be uh, conveyed through uh, supposedly loyal Ukrainian TV channels, uh, even those uh, like 112 uh, imitating pluralism, inviting somebody like yourself uh, to, to, to continue. Uh, uh, anymore, yeah, but, 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 but you were until recently, and, and, and they were imitating the pluralism, of, of, including some, some reformists, some nationalists, and, 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 some, and some not reformists, some, not, uh, some uh, uh, Moscow friendly uh, audience and they imitated this this discussion this pluralism but in a way th that allowed uh, some outright moscow messages to be uh, to, to be included there so now they they they, uh, they uh, uh, drop the pretense of this engineering pluralism they, they narrow the scope of allowed and 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 people with with a, with a true reformist agenda are no longer welcome there but their reputation as as mouthpieces for for for, for discussion for is already established so uh, there are lots of ways to, to, to uh, impose, uh, to, uh, to convey Moscow friendly, Moscow helpful messages through uh, channels which, are, which will not be pre uh, pre perceived as, as Moscow's mouthpieces. Thank you. Well, we're already eating into our uh, coffee break, so let me thank all the presenters. Thank you for your questions and feel free to ask them. Uh,